O B G this is about Nightmare on Elm Street, or the second one in fact, and um, something that many people aren't quite aware of. But after the success of Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street, which was a sequel, and Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Re uh, Revenge, after that was uh, promptly released uh, in 1985, um, the film attracted massive audiences, and Robert Englund's Freddy Krueger was largely the same, but the dynamic uh, interaction between the hunter and the hunted, Freddy and Jesse, were intimate, and they seemed to share a secret, and the subtext of that relationship gave Freddy's, uh, Freddy's Revenge a homoerotic undercurrent that eventually made it a cult classic. And it created quite a homophobic backlash at the time because instead of using a final girl to face Freddy, they used a final boy. I'll come to that in a minute. And that was played by their rather handsome Mark Patton. And it was just the fact that they used a male um, or it, sorry, it wasn't a fact that they just used a male to do that lead. It was um, also that there were strong reactions to the writing. In one iconic scene, Freddie places his blade on Jason's lips and rubs it around in a scene which originally intended him to insert it into his mouth. Now, going back to the final girls, the final girl is actually a film trope. And in its simplest form, this is the last character left alive in the film to confront the killer. And it can be a male, but it's almost always a female. And the term was coined by Carol J. Clover in 1972 in a book, and wait for this, um, Men, Women and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film, A Critical Examination of Slasher Movies. That was the title of a book, a book with a title that long actually exists. Now, film theory provides different interpretations for the final girl, from her being the embodiment of stereotypes of what women should be, to feminists claiming that it forces a male to identify with the woman. And other reasons for the backlash was aimed at Patton's character of Jesse, who was accused of screaming like a girl and was given scenes that had a distinctly gay uh, subtext, subsex, a <laughs> little Freudian slip there. So the character um, is at times possessed by Freddy, and at one point Jesse actually tells his girlfriend he's inside me and he wants to take me again. Now, there is a documentary titled um, Scream Queen, uh, My Name on Elm Street, and that examines the film in depth. And Tyler Jensen, the co-director, said the beauty of Nightmare on Elm Street 2 for gay people is that it was the first gay movie that they could enjoy without anyone else knowing that they were enjoying a gay film. And I remember being a, clo a closeted teen and just seeking out these films that I could enjoy. And he said that he didn't have to explain to everybody else. If you're a 13 year old um, and you uh, get out the film, Call Me By Your Name or Brokeback Mountain, everyone's going to know you're gay. But if you're a 13 year old renting a nightmare on Elm Street too, they just think you're watching a horror film. And that's what I think the beauty of the movie is and why it's so important to people. And its legacy continues. This is what he said. <laughs> and although the film was a relative financial success and propelled... Um, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise along, it was derided by critics and genre fans. Now, screenwriter uh, David Chaskin, he spent years refusing to acknowledge any intentional subtext in his scripts, a position that he's since reversed. And the director, Jack Sh Shoulder, he claimed not to have noticed the movie's gayness during filming. And watching Freddy's Revenge now, it's hard to comprehend that there was ever a debate over the film's subtext, uh, subtext which becomes just plain and uh, obviously blatantly homoerotic when you watch it again. If you've ever wondered why this film appeared to be a, uh, a little bit camp, now you know. And remember, you heard it here first on the OBG show. Oh,